and uh, not necessarily in any way to cast aspersions, but just merely to label and provide a set that allows me to think about these people in a particular way. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of these guys talk about timelines. And in, from my perspective and that of the Buddhist and the uh, um, yogis of the past, timelines don't exist per se. There is no such thing as reality in the sense of a river flowing towards you. The, there's no such thing as time behind you. The idea of the present moment exists, and everybody hears this, but they fail to comprehend what it really means, and that is that the present moment is being created fractional milliseconds before our perception of it. And it is that gap, that little spark gap, if you will, like the if you knew, for instance, the timing of an engine, you could set up a resonator and disable that engine. Mm -hmm. uh, or you could, in fact, use that engine to power a radio just because of its spark gap. Yes. And that kind of thing exists in reality. And that's kind of what we're using to power our work, yeah. if that makes sense. Which is really interesting because you're mixing the technology with something that, uh, you know, cultures, uh, religious leaders and cultures have been talking about for a very long time. Yeah, and we just kind of stumbled over. <laughs> yes, you know, like, look what I found. So I know that, uh, and we talked about this before, and a lot of people ask questions about this, is whenever it comes to things like slang or even um, maybe just different terminology for things. Um, does that, uh, is that a stumbling block in the data that you put? That's, why, that's where most of our processing is, because what we have to do is we have to reduce things down to archetypes. Yes. And that's where this massive concept of the set theory uh, arises. Basically what we do is we aggregate words and turn them into a four-digit hexadecimal number simply because it's easier to, to deal with hexadecimal integers as opposed to ASCII text for a particular word. Mm -hmm. And hexadecimal integer is a known size and we can accommodate hundreds of millions of words at any given time within that, that range. Mm -hmm. And the hexadecimal integer is computationally uh, easy to flow through computer software. And we sort these into a giant database, a SQL Server database, and then we hit that database with prolog programs looking for particular kinds of sets that then in turn display this information in an IntelliCAD uh, artificial reality as a bunch of pixels of various different hues and this kind of thing. In order to achieve that, we basically have that huge stumbling block of reducing the different concepts, the slangs, and so on, down into these archetypes. But that is where we derive our timing sequence, because you've really hit on it. You have different slang, for instance, and that's where lang that's the bleeding edge of all language. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids are creating new language, which will flow through the generation, stick with their generation, and die with their generation, but also dominate during their generation. And when we die, our, our slang drops off and becomes archaic. And basically what slang is is the concept of it's not your papa's emotion. So you don't use your papa's language to describe how you're feeling about things. You invent new words and terms among yourself and your peers. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so if we find slang language developing around a particular archetype, we know we've got what we call immediacy values. That it's a very sharp-edged kind of a thing because slang oftentimes doesn't take. It has a very short lived uh, lifespan that seemingly doesn't fit and it dies off to be replaced by another slang term for that same kind of a concept until something does grab hold and then that goes through the whole generation. So well, basically what we're doing is we're looking at slang expressions as our bleeding edge and from there that's one of our key timing clues is the use of slang and how it permeates and flows through these particular kinds of discussions. Right. And then all the way out at the other end is legal language because legal language has been so formalized as to become as heavy as a brick with a lifespan of, of a long damn time. Yes, indeed. Well, I was I was try to uh, imagine. I mean, here you get you, you compile all this data, and you start looking at it. And how do you go through and sort through to know how the pieces fit together? As far as an event in Wall Street, or an event in uh, the world, or earthquake, or tornado, or flood, or war, or what have you. How do you, how do you actually? Well, Sort you, just hit a, you just hit on it with your whole series of questions because you basically reduced it down to their archetypes, yeah. earthquake, war, etc. So we find we have archetypes, and uh, these archetypes are very well defined. An archetype uh, might be, for instance, war, which has 44,000 nouns and verbs which describe it in our database. Mm -hmm. And whenever we find any of those 44,000, more or less, uh, nouns and verbs associated in a particular way, then we put a tick mark next to war, which heightens that particular uh, hue of that particular pixel group. 
I see. Makes sense. Yes. Now, okay, so as they, they kind of like brighten in a very much like a constellation or Hubble view of a very uh, dusty universe. And right. as they brighten up, then, then this is basically what I see in my little display is a bunch of these brightening and waning dots. And then I go ahead and stop the display going to that area find a group of them and take those numbers and then go back and resolve them back into the words and see what we're actually looking at. Right, right. And, and then we make an interpretation from that. Well, 09, a lot of people are uh, sending an email tonight that are uh, kind of getting their predictions, kind of like tapping their psychic centers a little bit to send in their predictions, which we're, we're putting all the emails off to the side and recording them and saving them. Um, which should be kind of interesting because I'm gonna I, I've been reading through a lot of these that have come through and just kind of making mental notes of them. So when we start talking about a lot of uh, things here with that you're seeing in the data for '09, um, I'm gonna pull some of these emails off that kind of uh, kind of match with what you're, what we're talking about here tonight. So should be kind of fun. And sure, of course, sounds cool. Yeah. And of course we're gonna take uh, live phone calls from uh, listeners out there here uh, after the next break um, and uh, kind of bring them on for their prediction and uh, questions for you. So we're just going to kind of do an open line type thing as well. This should be fun. Uh, bring, in the, bring in the new year that way. It should be a lot of fun. So everybody stay right where you are because we're uh, close to the top of the hour here. So we do have to take a break, but we will be back in a moment. So stay right where you are. My guest tonight is Cliff from Half Past Human, and we're doing a little prediction stuff for, uh, for 09. It should be a lot of fun. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. And welcome back, everybody. Happy New Year to everybody, or Happy New Year's Eve, anyway. Uh, here we are, last show of uh, 08. We've got uh, Cliff from Half Past Human here joining us. We're going to be talking about some of the uh, data that he's been seeing, some, some possible forecasts for uh, 09. And uh, boy, oh boy, i got some questions rolling in for you folks out there, which I don't mind at all. Feel free to email me, cafejackwpr2radio.com. I will keep a close eye on the emails tonight, we're going to be talking about a couple of things here right off the bat. One of them, um, a uh, Russian professor has uh, been talking about the, 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 the fall, the destruction of uh, the United States uh, economically, and which would lead into a civil war. Um, part of Canada would move in, take over part of the United States. Uh, of course, Alaska would go back to Russian control. Which is kind of uh, interesting, and this is what he's been predicting for a long time. He says that the numbers are good, the data is positive on this. I don't know. Let's, uh, Cliff, uh, did you did you see that article about that uh, guy? Yeah, yeah, I've read read the article, and I went and read some of the underlying research, and and I have to say I don't disagree with a lot of it, but I do have a lot of suspicions about his conclusions. That is to say, the particular way in which he says the U.S. would break up and be assigned, if you will, to other countries. Yes. Because it, uh, it, it, on its face, it denies the complexity of the situation, and it's seeing the United States from outside the U.S. So he has no idea how gnarly it's going to get once we get to scrap it among ourselves and just what we would do. But one thing I can assure you of is that the United States in general... Uh, has a, a predisposition culturally to not want to necessarily align with people. Uh -huh. And so I think that even if we were to dissolve, it would be kind of like a nest of badgers. We wouldn't really want to go and associate with the badgers next door. Yes, So, so his conclusions that far I find to be erroneous. It might be very uh, wishful it, thinking on his part because I know... Exactly. Gonna... It's actually it's a projection of certain power situations that exist now. Yes. He fails to take into account, for instance, that China is loath to ex historically loath to extend power across oceans. Yes. Uh, it's only done so for in Africa for resources. We'll also be facing the collapse of the dollar, which is going to trigger all of this. And we'll have severe repercussions on their society. We'll be they'll be facing revolution internally. He's probably correct in that Russia probably will not face revolution the way that um, pretty much the rest of the planet will. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Russia is going to extend itself to the point of becoming a planetary policeman and trying to keep the former United States from destroying itself internally. Yes. Makes sense? Yes, absolutely. And I know that in one of the articles, whenever they were talking to him about this, he... Um 
he kind of coyly smiled at the idea of the United States kind of falling apart. But he did say that if that were, were to happen, it would be wouldn't be so great for Russia though either. Correct. Yeah, it, it, it's not a good thing for anyone. Yes. In our data sets, we actually can't deny the underlying theme that economic pressures will push us to the brink and beyond. Now, what that beyond is going to be is his supposition would be that we would would have some level of civil war or, or dissolution. Mm -hmm. That that may be correct. We may have a dissolution, but I doubt it'll fracture out along the way that he thinks. Yes, but you you are definitely seeing something in the data that kind of suggests that he's he may be correct on this, though, right? Um, to a certain extent, it validates his position, but his position, let's bear in mind, is in isolation. He does not note that the same pressures that are going to create revolution in the U.S. are also going to create revolution throughout Europe, through most of the Anglo-American uh, Empire, mm -hmm. and certainly in China and in its area of influence. Mm -hmm. So 